Good evening. It's Joyful Christian Hermit. Well, I've had quite a day of it. I had injections in the neck, the third occipital, occipital lobes on either side he went in. And this one was very, very painful, each needle going down into the neck and finding those lobes, I guess. <laughs> And I don't know, I'll know more in the morning if it's really helped the headache much, but um, made me very off balance today. But also, more prayers, more situations. Um, I pick up things when I'm out. And it's, I think I just feel deeply for people. I love deeply. And then I get, little insights into why maybe someone is acting the way they are or reacting. And so I've been praying in the holy name of Jesus for a couple of people, particularly one, um, well, both really, and just a whole nother situation. And it became so intense that this evening later I just had to distract so I, I actually distracted with the internet just reading about other people's lives and somehow that helped. Um, and I thought about the, you know, what I was asked to do was to not use the internet. And I realized sometimes we really have to go, as Eileen had, had suggested, you know, go with our deepest instinct that God places within us of what we need at certain times. And of course, the mind would think that we should, uh, I should have instead just been, you know, praying, praying for the, these couple of people. And, but no, I, my mind needed refreshing and it needed to get away into other people's lives. So I want to share with you tonight, I was going to do it a few days ago. Her uh, day of celebration was actually November 4th, or no, November 8th, I'm sorry, November 8th, three days ago. Elizabeth of the Trinity, got a, this book, He is My Heaven, that's what she looks like in real life. It's her photograph. She was born in 1880, Elizabeth Cates to a, a mother and a, a fa her father was in the military, the French military. And he died suddenly when she was age seven. She was the eldest. And, um, but she was born very spiritually inclined. And she early on wanted to be a Carmelite. She was really drawn to the Carmelites. And she See, she would have been 17 when St. Therese passed away. But she was aware of her book, The Story of a Soul, and that likely influenced her some, I would think so. It became very popular in France, um, St. Therese, The Little Flowers Autobiography. Um, but as it turned out, Elizabeth of the Trinity went to a Carmel in Dijon, France. And she, her mother wasn't in favor of her becoming a, a Carmelite nun. The mother had some lovely suitors making offers. Back then they would pay the family to, you know, give them money and um, to have the daughter. Uh, and showed the wealth that they'd have and what a good life they would offer the daughter. And so her mother really wanted a marriage for her, a wonderful life for her in society. Finally, the mother agreed, you know, understood that she wasn't going to change Elizabeth's mind. So Elizabeth went to Carmel, and uh, she was there not that long, actually, she got Addison's disease. Now it's curable, so we don't even hear about it anymore. But she died. Um, let's see. When was that? 19, oh, 1907, I believe, or 1906. 
she was 20, would have been 1906, she was 26 years old when she passed away, a very painful uh, ailment and died a very painful death. But um, she wrote a few things when she was in Carmel. Um, this she wrote later on after she was professed religious. She wasn't a novice anymore. Wrote this in a letter to someone. I can't find words to express my happiness. Here there is no longer anything but God. He is all. He suffices and we live by him alone. Then, let's see, there's another. Her beatification was in 1984. Pope John Paul II and her canonization was in 2016, just eight years ago. So she, it took her a little longer, but she um, wrote quite a bit. She was a writer, a mystic, and a Carmelite, and suffered greatly. And she did do her best to suffer um, well, to accept her, her early death with a peace and equanimity of spirit, I'd call it. So she also wrote... Um, and this was shortly after she entered the Carmel, which was over 200 miles from her home, so pretty far away from her mother and her younger sister. And um, so it was hard on her mother to lose her first child, her daughter, to Carmel. I think she could, I don't know if then they could go, the family could maybe go and watch the marriage ceremony, but I don't think they did, this mother did, just for the distance of it. But she entered Carmel in 1901, so she was 21 years old. <clears throat> um, and she said, I find God everywhere while doing the wash as well as while praying. She was thrilled to be there, and that was, it says, he is my heaven. She found her place in Carmel, where she said, you know, that God is everywhere here. God is everywhere. And here's another thing that she wrote one time. She said, I think that, that in heaven, <clears throat> my mission will be to draw souls by helping them to go out of themselves in order to cling to God by a holy, simple, and loving movement and to keep them in this great silence, which will allow God to communicate himself to them and transform them into himself. So she is very similar to uh, Therese, the little flower, also a Carmelite, who <clears throat> passed away, I think she was 24 years old, but she was, um, Therese was a little older, when she entered Carmel, or not older when she entered Carmel, but um, was born a little earlier. But they are, they're pretty much contemporaries in the same time period. And they, each of them, Therese the Little Flower and Elizabeth of the Trinity, each had a charism of love, love of God and love of others, and a desire for, for souls, to save souls, to bring souls to Christ. So they had that very much in common. <clears throat> um, a zeal for contemplation also, for, for prayer that is beyond mental prayer. So um, at her last words of this very painful death, <clears throat> I am going to light to love, to life. So that's beautiful. Another thing that distinguishes Elizabeth of the Trinity <clears throat> is she was reading, she loved to read scripture, of course, and she noticed St. Paul's repetitive phrase, praise of glory, praise of glory. I'm trying to remember what, what book of the, what epistle that is in. 
it might be Ephesians, <clears throat> but <clears throat> she took that as a name for herself. She called herself Laudem Gloriae, and that's praise of glory in Latin. She took that name, and she hoped that that would be what she would be called in heaven, the name that she would be called by in heaven. She was hoping that it would be Laudem Gloria, Gloria, praise of glory. She wanted to live her life, and she did in Carmel, as God's praise of glory, as a praise of glory to God. So she set her focus on that phrase, praise of glory, and called herself that among the sisters, you know. They didn't talk much, but when she would, or when she wrote of herself, she would refer to herself in the third person as praise of glory, laudum gloriae. So at some point, I want to talk to you all, share with you mottos and also our heavenly names. So we'll do that another time, but I just wanted to touch base on um, Therese. And there's so much more to her life. I want to uh, read what she wrote of the Trinity, but I have some books here. Um, this one is Elizabeth of Dijon, because Dijon was the town of the Carmel, the Carmel of Dijon. I'm going to see if there's any. So this is, um, you know, if you want to study someone, just get a few, you can get the... Uh, two or three different biographies by different authors. This one is a little more contemporary book. He is My Heaven by Jennifer Moorcroft, The Life of Elizabeth of the Trinity. And it goes through her early years. She actually struggled with temper. She had a terrible temper as a child that she had to overcome, and she knew it. If she wanted to enter Carmel, she came to a point in her childhood where she had a turnaround herself and got control over her temper. And um, it, was, it was after her father had died when she was age seven. That may have had something to do with her, temp her issues with temper, but it seems also she was born with a dispensation to flash, have a fiery spirit. And she had to die to herself, and she did that. But she had quite the social life. Her mother insisted and would, you know, get her beautiful gowns and and make sure she, you know, caused her to go to different parties and was really intent on finding her a suitable match, and she did. But I want you just to look. Here's this let me get this right. Look at those eyes. The eyes of a mystic, a very intent and deep and distant at the same time. Here's another image of her. Um, and in Carmel, she found her peace. Now this book, Elizabeth, uh, the complete works. These are her spiritual writings. And then this is the volume one. And this is volume two. Letters from Carmel. Let's see if there's photos in here of her. But lots of different letters. It's fascinating to read. Well, here's one of her... Um, this was three days after her entrance and left to right. So I think they have that opposite, though. I believe she's right down in right, let me get my finger here, right there. She entered Carmel with these other young women. In 1901, in August, um, it was just short. I think she was born August, or no, was she born July 18th, maybe? 
So she entered August in, in early August of 1901. So she was just 21. Here she is as a novice with her mother and sister. Gite, Gite was her sister. This was the day of her canonical examination before profession of vows. It was in 1902. She'd been in Carmel um, a year and four months. There she is with her sister and her mother who had come to see her after her examination, but before she was going to be. So maybe they were there for her profession of vows, probably. So I didn't realize that. I misspoke earlier. This is a picture of her in 1903 in the Monastery Gardens, reading. Reading her, it looks like a breviary or a prayer book. It says it's her manual. Um, open at the New Testament. So they had a combination book that they gave the, the nuns um, that included the New Testament and probably the divine office and, and probably the statutes and the rules of Carmel, the rule of life that they would follow. Another photo of her. So I'm, I'm sharing her, and I'm going to read what she wrote about the Trinity. She had a great adoration of the Trinity. That's why she chose the name Elizabeth of the Trinity. There she is again. Let's see when this was taken. This was in early 1903 also. Um, she was holding her profession crucifix. So she had already professed her vows as a Carmelite. And then all this writing she did, all these... Oh, here's another one. Oh... Here her is a photo of her sister, Marguerite, who they called Geet, with her husband, Georges, and their daughters, Sabbath and Odette. She has a photo here of her sister and her children. And this was in 1905, her younger sister. So her... It's, you know, but she was very content. Oh, here she is. Um, this is right before she was dying. She was in the infirmary in this next photo I'll show you. And above her head is a print of the Annunciation given to her by a woman she corresponded with, Madame Sordon. But there she, oops, let me get this, so you can see, there she is. And see her, of course, they had medications then. Um, Therese of Lisieux, I, I, this has helped me many times that I happened to read this in one of her letters, that she said if it weren't for that they took away the, the uh, bottle of pills by her nightstand, that they didn't leave them there, she said she would have been tempted to have taken many. And um, I used to get these before the, they put the, installed the pump in my abdomen. Had a surgery in four years ago in October. Four, it's already been in four years. Um, I had these horrible spinal headaches for years and years. Well, ever since 1987 until... Uh, 2020 and I'm telling you they were they would get to the point that I didn't keep I didn't have medication then but I did have it here from 2019 when I had a one got my wonderful pain doctor who God had him somehow from the get-go trust and and saw the pain in me and um 
Whereas up until that time, I'd had a terrible time. And in, uh, in the Midwest, I went for 17 years without pain medication. It was horrific, especially during the one doctor who I knew for a while he sent a home health nurse to do an injection that would knock me out for 24 to 36 hours. Um, I had a letter from my doctor in California saying how much it took of Demerol and Visteral to, because he experimented, you know, to, to actually get me out of pain. And it was so much that I needed that letter to show. But this one doctor took pity, and but he didn't, keep it up, but he did for a while when I'd have the horrible, horrible pain sieges with the headache, but um, yes, there were times that I would have been, um, I was glad to read that she had, they had opioids then, of course, opium, and it looks as if maybe they'd given some to Elizabeth of the Trinity, she looked like she was partially sedated, for which I'm grateful. If not, then God blessed her with being able to cope. I admit that I could not cope well. I made it through by the grace of God those years, but it, it had its effect. There's no photos in this one. So these are just some books that um, give more details. If you want to know about these people especially find their letters that they wrote and read their letters to other people. Gives you a very personal insight into who they really were and how they really felt. It makes them very human compared to the hagiographers, the, the people who write about saints and glorify them into, you know, as if they were already or angels on earth, which they are, but they were still human. And it, I find it more encouraging for us to know their reality, to know their human side. But this is a human side of Elizabeth of the Trinity, where she wrote this prayer to the Holy Spirit. Or, I mean, no, to the Holy Trinity. She wrote this, uh, an ode, practically, a, like a love song to the Holy Trinity. And I will... In there. Huh. there. No, something caught me up in the mail. All right, this is what she wrote, just from her heart, in, an inspired heart, a heart in love with God, with the Trinity. larger here. Oh my God, Trinity whom I adore, let me entirely forget myself that I may abide in you still and peaceful as if my soul were already in eternity. Let nothing disturb my peace nor separate me from you, O oh my unchanging God, but that each moment may take me further into the depths of your mystery. Pacify my soul, Make it your heaven, your beloved home, and place of your repose. Let me never leave you there alone, but may I ever be attentive, ever alert in my faith, ever adoring, and all given up to your creative action. See, she's writing this to the Trinity. And notice in here that she's borrowed some lines, some inspiration from St. Teresa of Avila who wrote a prayer, uh, let nothing disturb thee, nothing affright thee, um, you know, nothing is changing. So she wrote that this line, I'll repeat it, let nothing disturb my peace nor separate me from me, from you, O my unchanging God, but that at each moment may take me further into the depths of your mystery. So it's all right when we read something from another person, who, a saint or someone who's inspired us. Here she did. And these very words and some of these little phrasings are very similar to that prayer 
poem of Teresa of Avila. And that's okay. We, we are here to be inspired by others and to inspire, to pass on the inspiration. Because what Teresa of Avila wrote maybe came from uh, P St. Peter of Alcantara's writings or, or um, St. Alphonsus Rodriguez. So, you know, people from her time period. And uh, Peter of Alcantara was her spiritual director for a while. And I think it was she had his books at her bedside or else she had Alphonsus Rodriguez's was her nighttime reading. So um, the point is, is allow ourselves to be inspired and to re-inspire others. So she continues, Oh, my beloved Christ, she first addressed God. Now she's addressing, Oh, beloved Christ, crucified for love, would that I might be for you a spouse of your heart. I would anoint you with glory. I would love you even unto death. Yet I sense my frailty and ask you adorn me with yourself. Identify my soul with all the movements of your soul. Submerge me, overwhelm me, substitute yourself in me that my life may become but a reflection of your life. Come into me as adorer, redeemer, and savior. Now she addresses um, the eternal word. O eternal word, word of my God, would that I might spend my life listening to you, would that I might be fully receptive to learn all from you, in all darkness, all loneliness, all weakness, may I ever keep my eyes fixed on you and abide under your great light. O my beloved star, fascinate me so that I may never be able to leave your radiance. Now she addresses the consuming fire, the Holy Spirit. O consuming fire, spirit of love, descend into my soul and make all in me as an incarnation of the word, that I may be to him a super added humanity wherein he renews his mystery. And you, O Father, bestow yourself and bend down to your little creature, seeing in her only your beloved Son, in whom you are well pleased. O my three, my all, my beatitude, infinite solitude, immensity, in whom I lose myself, I give myself to you as a prey to be consumed. Enclose yourself in me, that I may be absorbed in you, so as to contemplate in your light the abyss of your splendor. So, um, in this one book, let's see, I had another book up here. Let me find it. Oh, yes. The Spiritual Doctrines of Elizabeth of the Trinity. In this book, I have it marked. A couple, oh, that's where I was reading. Um, the, and toward the end, I hadn't read this part yet. But it goes in depth describing this, the different sections for several pages here. Oh my God, Trinity, whom I adore. Her her prayer to the Holy Spirit, to the whole I mean to the Holy Trinity. And it goes through the different sections and the different phrases even, like help me. Um as changeless as, as peaceful as though my soul we're already in eternity, and then it discusses these different thoughts that she has. Give peace to my soul, what all that means. So, um, she has been analyzed and written about beautifully and extensively, even from that one prayer to the Holy Trinity that she wrote from her heart. And maybe having read St. Teresa of Avila's writings or whatever, uh, that one little line up there, a couple of lines, reflected some of that. So I say it's okay. And the more we read scripture, the more we will speak 
of the thoughts and the words of Christ ourselves. So I'm encouraging everyone. Elizabeth of the Trinity was a young woman, just a young person, a young human being who loved God very much, just as all of you. And I encourage you to start thinking about a motto, pray and ask the Holy Spirit, or Jesus or God, or all through the Trinity, if you have a motto, to please reveal it to you. If you have a heavenly name, if God wills, to let you know what you're going to be called in heaven, if you want to know, if you're, I'll, I'll tell you the story about how I found out. Um, so, um, another time, I'm trying to keep these short, but let's do this. Let's take our next steps in the narrow path in a focused way and start asking questions and start asking favors of God and helps along the way. And then do our part too, also, in keeping up with scripture. Doesn't have to be a lot. One line. Remember how St. Teresa of Avila meditated on the Lord's Prayer. Line by line, practically word by word. She would be lost in contemplation um, after the Our Father, hallowed be thy name. She would get that far and be consumed in contemplative prayer by just those words. Our, you know, Heavenly Father, um, or thou, thou art in heaven. You know, what is heaven? So, um, to actually contemplate rather than rushing through just to be finished with it. And um, let, let God lead, let the Trinity lead us. And if you want, if something strikes you in Scripture or some phrase or something comes to mind as even who you are on earth, she was praise of glory. Uh, be free. Be free to communicate with God and to trust. If a little thought flashes or you're reading along and, and something really resonates with you, that you think, that is so rich, or that is so me, or something, or that's how I want to be, adopt that. The Holy Spirit doesn't tend to come and hit us over the head. It's usually through subtle little nudges. And, and God doesn't mind if we have some thought of our own. Well, all thoughts come from God in essence. We are spiritual beings. God is in us. He is guiding our brains, our hearts, our everything. But, you know, at times it seems like we're human and we think, well, that was my thought. Um, it's okay. If it's a good one, adopt it, embrace it. God will be pleased. And start writing, start jotting little things down. Um, uh, communicate with God like you're writing letters or thoughts that come to mind of your love for God or, or a problem you're having even. And talk it over with God in that way. Or type it out on your laptop or something. Or uh, do a blog. And, and spiritual, jur jur spiritual journal that way. Um, do journaling that way. Or I'm doing it in essence with these videos. I'm sharing my spiritual life pretty much day by day. And um, so let's do that, and then I'll try the next time to, uh, we'll talk about mottos that might be good, or heavenly names, or both. There's even a scripture 
about being called, or called in heaven. I think it's in Revelation. I'll find that. But um, let's. And then, when you need a break, if think if your praying gets too heavy, your love and your intense concern, and the prayers get, do what's going to help you to take your mind away. If your mind needs a break, if it's something online or watching a bit of news or I don't even remember what I utilized to take my mind off. Um, but it did. It, it just drew me out from the heaviness and the concern and the intensity of the love I was feeling in my praying for a couple of people. And, of course, I've been praying for my friend, been praying for Sister Andrea, and I hope we get an update at some point. I will say my friend Mary is having a, a liver biopsy Thursday morning at 11, or no, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, East Coast United States, or Eastern Time. She's in the Midwest, but it's in the Eastern time zone. So that's 8 a.m. Eastern. So please pray if you think about Mary at that time. And we'll get her, we'll get her through all this. It takes a lot of strength to um, deal with these shocks that we have. And even if we have incredible faith, which she does. And I also wanted to tell Clara, who left a message, that for several months... Mary has been sleeping with a, a blessed relic badge of a Father Solanus Casey, blessed Solanus Casey, under her pillow at night. So she's already been doing that. Thank you for the suggestion, and she was very grateful. And also, Robin, she appreciates your prayers and everyone's prayers. So um, didn't realize I had my little band on from my surgical procedure, those injections. So get this off. God bless his real presence in us. And let's just go with the flow of inspiration of expressing our thoughts, our prayers, our love of God, and be led. Let's just be led down this narrow path where he wants to take us. It's an adventure. It's an adventure. Have a beautiful rest of your night or day.